it doesn't seem to be always right but then who is he, his concept don't seem to be universally true but then what concepts are but they seem to be very useful uh, very useful at certain points of discussion and this uh, cover it's a relatively new cover of uh, one of the newer editions of the book it sums up Campbell's concept quite nicely and his main concept as both the folklorist which he was primarily a student of myth and mythology an ethnographer and to some point also a psychologist his point is so there is a universal pattern always the same or very similar to be discerned in a development of a certain kind of hero the hero that is, you know, hero par excellence, the one that fights, the one that kills monsters, the one that makes the world a better place. And in all the world mythology, the concept is the same. Campbell's starting point was the mythology of Northern America. The myths of the native Northern American tribes. His first book analyzing the universal character of this myth was on James Joyce. So you can see that it's rather diverse. The application doesn't seem very obvious. It works fantastically. Later on, he became uh, identified somehow as a main source of inspiration for the concept that George Lucas used in Star Wars, which works, obviously, since Lucas was his student. So he apparently did know the concept. And uh, here we are at this point, which is something to be remembered. There are two ways of looking at it and two ways of using this idea. On one hand, there's the whole complex of myths, legends, fables, stories, which, well, which were the basic uh, material for Campbell, the one where this concept appears because such is the development of culture. On the other hand, you will see it applied consciously. So, when we look into the development of the myth of Jason and the Argonauts uh, in ancient writers, they obviously don't use it consciously. When, however, we look at, say, the Matrix, we may ask yourself a question. Is it a natural development of the story? or? are the points in that story such as they are because the writer knows the concepts mm -hmm. of Campbell. Mm -hmm. So when we analyze modern culture, after 1968 mostly, because that's when the book becomes influential, after its second edition, we must always ask ourselves, is it so because it is so or is it so because the author is complying to a certain mythological or mythographic, mythopoetic concept? This is something that is worth remembering. And I believe that most of you have, this way or the other, looked into Campbell's concepts. Nevertheless, here they are. I haven't uh, drawn that beautiful uh, diagram. I'm not that talented. We start here, go all full circle, we end here. And we have three main stages, the stage of separation, the stage of initiation, and the stage of returning. And we will now analyze point by point all those 17 stages with examples. Once again, worth bearing in mind is the fact that it doesn't have to apply to all kinds of heroes. Even in Greek mythology or Roman mythology, which will be, of course, our starting point, since this class is formerly, uh, formally done as a... Uh, part of the curriculum of the classical studies. Uh, uh, we will see that there are characters like Prometheus, for example, who do not fit. Also, one more thing. Some of those elements, especially of this part, may repeat themselves. So when you look at a certain story, some sequences will repeat repeat themselves, some will be unique. Also, 
if you look at the longer developments, like for example, we have the myth of Hercules. You can either look at the story from the birth to his apotheosis as this large circle, or within it, you can treat each of the adventures, for example, each of the labors of Hercules as a full circle. Some fit better, some fit worse. But generally, one doesn't exclude the other. This is, of course, the basic scheme. And if anyone wants to quarrel with it during the class, they're more than welcome. Uh, and we start with the first part. If, uh, here, there's a circle. We have, as you can see, two halves. This is, this is the hero's journey, all the 17 stages. And the world divides in three parts, or two halves. This half here is our world, everyday world, normal human world. This is the other world. And now, whether it is the underworld, it is some country far away beyond, you know, seven oceans and seven mountains, it is some kind of wasteland, it is the land of the dead, or it's a foreign planet, whatever. This is normal, this is not. This is everyday, this is not. Here are two points, point of entry and point of exit, which somehow divided. But if you look here, here's also the line of division, because this is the time when the hero is not yet the hero. This is the time when he already is a hero. And here we are, and this is the part called separation. What do we separate, what do we divide, uh, tell apart from? The hero must leave his safe little world. The safe little world where he used to live, where he was relatively unhappy, usually he's relatively unhappy in this world, but well, not unhappy enough to leave it. Uh, and the meaning of this part is to give the hero the chance to become a hero, to stop being ordinary. Try bearing in mind, if you know anything about the Jungian psychology, try to remember that, just like Lucas was the student of Campbell, so was Campbell of Jung. And that Jungian concepts of growing up, of the development of a a unit, uh, an, an identity, a personality, can well be applied to this. So here we are, our hero is in a, a metaphorical meaning, just a child. He may be a young adult, but he's just a child as far as the um, mental qualities, as far as his uh, lack of the knowledge of the world, as far as his uh, lack of will to engage with the world are concerned, he must be separated from this uh, quiet, tepid, everyday world in order to start an adventure. I give you two examples. An example from the part of the story of Hercules, that large part that encompasses the labors of Hercules. Hercules finished his uh, tasks, which were connected with the fact that he had to uh, somehow repay his, uh, for his, um, for the murder of his wife, which he committed in madness. And now he's, you know, a wandering hero. He has very little to do. But then he gets an order, an order that comes from gods themselves, that he has to return to Peloponnese and he starts, uh, has to start serving his cousin, the king, the Mycenaean king. Uh, or Jason, another Greek hero, and this is this obvious beginning. He finds out, after a long childhood, that actually he is not some boy living in the exile somewhere uh, on the uh, today's Volos Peninsula in uh, Greekness. He is an heir to the throne. Any other examples, please? You find out you're a wizard, for example. <laughs> Uh, this is the general overview of this part. Now, the elements. The hero is called to adventure, which is our starting point. 
and it can be as grand as uh, Perseus finding out that his mother will have to marry the evil and awful king if he doesn't perform the impossible task of killing Medusa, or as everyday and as obvious, if we take a literary, rather mythological narrative, of a policeman who gets his case. Something happened, the hero must solve it. Uh, I gave you the favorite, uh, the mythographer's favorite character, uh, favorite motive from the, uh, from the fairy tales. There's a boy, he lives quietly with his mother or father, it depends on the version of the fairy tale. Then the mother or father gets mortally either wounded or sick, and the young man has to go to bring the water of life to revive them. So, there was this barely satisfying existence, but it was satisfying enough for him not to be forced to leave. But now, some new circumstance arises. Mm. Or, my favorite Arthurian example from Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, where Sir Gawain gets a challenge. <laughs> he has to fight the Green Knight because, well, he's a knight, so he has to fight. He gets challenged and the story starts. You can see another other pretty example here. This is a Roman, uh, a Roman relief from uh, Hadrian's times, more or less. What is that scene? Sisyphus? No. It's not Sisyphus. Thesius. Because there is something under, yes? Theseus. It's Theseus, exactly. This is Theseus, who is being called to adventure. His mother, Aithra, who's standing here, uh, has just decided that he's old enough to lift the stone. Under the stone, there is the sword of his father. Up until then, Theseus was a child, a boy, which is, of course, symbolized by the fact that he has only the mother. He has no idea who his father is. Now he finds out that his father is the king of Athens, who, in addition to that, is childless. So Theseus is not only a prince, he is also an heir to the throne. He is called to adventure. You have a classic, classic example of being called to adventure. You are told that you come from the special family and with that special power comes special responsibility. <laughs> now, the hero may refuse. This part doesn't always appear, but it does quite often when the hero says no. The reasons might be various. He may say, I am not good enough to do it. I am unfit for that duty. Find yourself a better, a better soldier. If you remember the movie called uh, Indiana Jones, The Last Crusade, he says, you found yourselves the wrong Jones. This is a classic kind of <laughs> hero, hero refusing his call to adventure. He may be forbidden to come, like Theseus actually in some versions is forbidden to embark on his journey to Crete where he is to defeat the Minotaur because he is a prince and his father's only son. So he shouldn't go. He should stay in Athens, marry and guarantee the heir to a throne. Uh, he very often doesn't want to leave the hero because the comfortable, the barely comfortable life is just comfortable enough or he's simply uninterested in the adventure offered. Uh, if we think of the literary or movie versions, you think of a typical detective story where very often it starts from the policeman or the detective saying, no, it's not interesting enough, I'm not doing it. He refuses the adventure. Uh, Here's the hero who refuses the adventure. This is a drawing based on a, unfortunately, non-preserved, destroyed in the 20, early 20th century, mosaic. You can see a group of people, female people mostly, here, with one little example. There's a girl here who is not a girl at all, the boy dressed as a girl. Do you know who that boy is? It's a mythological story. Achilles. 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 This is Achilles, who is refusing his adventure because he is forbidden to go by his mother. So he is hidden among the girls on Skyros, 
uh, he will become a father of the son as a result of this. That's the real adventure. Uh, at this point, uh, sorry, because I think I might have not have missed one. Mm. At, oh, okay. At this point, the hero gets an additional help. He is either he has decided that he would go, or he is uncertain. So the help comes, and the help is usually of the supernatural kind. And it can come in various forms. So the hero may encounter just once some magical helper, or may be joined by some magical helper, or may be joined by a completely human helper, who, however, has some supernatural object, item, some supernatural uh, talisman, amulet, whatever else, a book of spells, whatever it can be. Uh, or the hero is given some kind of special power, or, or it is revealed that he indeed did have this special power from the very beginning. You're a wizard. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a number of examples, uh, classical examples here. Uh, Jason is about to perform the impossible quest, so Athena builds him a ship. Orestes is about to kill his mother, so Apollo promises that he will take care of him. Uh, Pelops is about to win a bride, so Poseidon gives him magical horses. We had this example last week. Or uh, Arthur is about to become king, so he gets a magical sword from the Lady of the Lake. Uh, also, at this point, the hero may be joined by his other helpers, who don't have to be very often, are not supernatural. Uh, he either gets a sidekick, who is uh, usually a secondary character, who is lower in station to the hero, so the hero's servant or in modern uh, narrative versions, uh, the hero's comical best friend, uh, the hero's companion. He may be accompanied by, uh, by his equal, like Orestes is by Pylades, in the example that we discussed, uh, that we discussed recently. Uh, so the team gathers at the time, and the supernatural helper may obviously join the team, or not, or be just someone. You will all know this kind of fairy tale narrative where a hero is embarking on his quest. An old woman is sitting by the road begging or sitting by the river waiting to be helped to cross the river. Everybody is scorning her, the hero helps her and she turns out to be a powerful witch who either gives him some advice or gives him some magical object. Uh, Russian fairy tales abound in that kind of, uh, that kind of story. And uh, here is the 19th century drawing, which is imitating, uh, I don't think it's a copy of any vase painting, it's imitating Orestes, Orestes as a suppliant to Apollo. Here's the classic painting by uh, Alan Lee, uh, an illustration to the Lord of the Rings, where you have a supernatural helper par excellence. Here's another supernatural helper. And as you can see, this supernatural aid usually stands at some distance to the character. So uh, he or she takes a, a, a person of a mentor, a leader, not necessarily a best friend, or uh, something like that, which of course doesn't have to be uh, exclusive. And here is the threshold. We are. The hero leaves his world. He leaves the safe, boring, comfortable world to embark on an adventure. He's crossing the threshold and there is no returning from that point on. Uh, the hero might do it by himself or he might uh, be prompted by some circumstances, some situations. Uh, have my favorite example here, uh, that is Hamlet, uh, who kept thinking that he should do something about his mother's marriage, because there's something wrong with this marriage, but something must be done. But only when he finds out for certain that yes, his father was murdered, he's prompted to take action. Not that he takes it as such, but at least he declares that he would. Uh, 
um, or in the German saga, which is, was later reworked by Richard Wagner, the, this is the moment when Sigurd, who has grown up not knowing of his real parentage, is sent by his foster father, the dwarf, to kill the dragon. He doesn't know what fear is, he doesn't know what does it mean to be afraid. He's not aware whatsoever what the dragon is. But he goes to kill the dragon. Uh, or, coming back to the Star Wars example, this is the moment when Luke Skywalker finds out that, well, he was supposed to stay to help his uncle, but now he has no uncle, because his family was murdered. So, he's free to go. Believe me or not, ladies and gentlemen, this is such a scene, but the gentleman in the middle is Hercules. <laughs> this is Hercules on the, on the crossroads. Uh, and the last example that we had from the middle of Hercules was from one segment of that narrative. This would be a starting point or the threshold point for the narrative uh, encompassing all the life of the hero. This is a 14th century reimagining of the scene of Hercules standing on the crossroads and there's a lady called Pleasure and a lady called Virtue and each of them suggests that he should follow her. Had he followed Lady Pleasure, he would have lived a quiet, pleasant life with no glory. But of course he chooses Adventure, who is in this story known as Virtue and he embarks on the life of a hero. Now what is that scene? Because this is another crossing of the threshold. Arthur, mm -hmm. Yes, this is Arthur taking the sword from the stone. <coughs> the decision has been made, he's about to become the king and uh, take all the responsibilities and dangers that come with it. This is of course the medieval medieval uh, illustration. You can go for adventure in your spaceship. Decide that it's time to leave the safe, well in this case the safe little world is well whatever you define your planet or your uh, solar system or your galaxy or your quadrant <laughs> as they call it in Star Trek or whatever else. You can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, in The Hobbit you have a very nice variation of the story with the refusal of the hero. He actually does refuse very firmly. But he is quite literally called to adventure, cannot stop himself, so he finally leaves. A great example of safe sweet world as well. Oh yes, <laughs> absolutely. Because in this case, it's not so as it is even in Star Wars, that the hero's existence is bar barely uh, bearable that there are some problems in his life. The only problem in Bilbo's life is that he is bored. He's not quite aware of that for a long time, but he is bored and he is somehow underachieving. There's more to him than uh, just being you know, ready for a nice quiet life and a lot of good food. And here we are in the other world. And uh, the part called initiation starts. This is the part when the hero becomes really the hero. In order to do that, he must undergo trials, he must fight monsters and enemies, overcome a number of dangers uh, and encounter various creatures, some of them friendly, some not. And, as I said, it does take place in the other world. And the first element of it uh, has a name which Campbell drawn from the very well-known biblical story uh, where it's called the belly of the whale. Like uh, Jonah the prophet who was swallowed by a whale and spent there three days. This is this part that will be most repeated. The hero leaves his safe world, enters the world of dangers and the first challenges come. At this stage, it will very rarely be the challenges of the real enemy of the hero. In most cases, it will be minor skirmishes, either with the helpers of the enemy or with just you know, random enemies that he meets on the way. Uh, 
A nice example, which I mostly like, is that from the myth of Theseus. He has found out that his father is the king of Athens, so he leaves in order to get uh, from Troizen, where he is uh, brought up, to Athens. He has to cross the Corinthian Isthmus, and the Isthmus is swarming with bandits. So there's the, here's our young brave boy who knows nothing of the world and who must defeat the monsters, or in this case, the bandits on his way. And uh, in his case, so either four or five repetitions, so either four or five bandits, depending on the source. And the similar, uh, the similar motive, uh, the similar uh, scheme of events repeats itself. Uh, or the, uh, the weather top scene in The Lord of the Rings is a very nice example where the characters are first attacked. They have just left the safe world where everything seemed rather normal and uh, here they come and they encounter the dangers. Or this, ladies and gentlemen. This is a very famous base painting, 5th century, uh, which shows Oedipus. It shows Oedipus discussing with Sphinx because Oedipus himself might have thought that this is the, uh, this is this point. This is the confrontation with the main enemy, but this is just the start. He meets his first enemy, who becomes later on a lesser evil among those that he encountered. Uh, and uh, when he has defeated the first dangers, the road of trials starts for the hero. At this point, the hero will be fighting or competing, gaining wisdom, gaining magical objects, and gaining helpers. And this may repeat how many, however many times you like in a story. It might be one enemy, it might be a group of enemies, it might be a series of tasks set for the hero. Mm. Would you, if, you, if you remember, there's a, one of the typical uh, Eastern European Slavonic fables will tell the story of a prince who wants to get his wife back and he will usually have three tasks. So you have the repetition of the motive. Three times, three different tasks, but the, mm, the scheme, the, the, the general outline of the adventure is just the same. Uh, typical scenes here will be the hero who has to uh, face his brother or his twin. The brother doesn't have to be literal, very, very rarely is in fact. It does happen sometimes, but not that often. The brother symbolically is someone who is like a hero. So for example, another warrior or someone with the same set of skills with the same set of, or similar set of possibilities. The hero's perfect counterpart or perfect opposite. You think Draco Malfoy to Harry Potter. It's a very nice, uh, very nice idea of the fight with the brother. Uh, and the fight with a snake or a dragon, which we discussed at some point as this typical adventure of a solar hero, uh, whose main uh, task is to protect order from chaos. Uh, as a result, the hero will be becoming uh, more proficient in fighting, more experienced in fighting, more successful at fighting. And this is not the only kind of trials that may await him, because also there will be those that would have less to do with fighting more with gathering various magical objects or playing some kind of games or tricking your enemy. And the game of riddles is typical. If you look into, say, the northern sagas, you will see it repeated over and over. The hero is challenged for the game of riddles. Usually there's a very high stake, his freedom or his life, and he usually wins. Uh, quite uh, common motive and quite commonly uh, appearing. And also somewhere at that stage he will meet the goddess. 
Now, who is the goddess? She doesn't have to be the goddess literally. She is a female character of one of the three types. So she's either a mother figure, so exactly, a goddess, a teacher, a spiritual protector, or she is a future wife of the character, or she's a helper. And uh, she may combine those aspects. So you may, for example, have the future wife who becomes part of the company or a helper, or a supernatural character who becomes a future wife. These aspects are very often combined, and very often she stands over the hero. She's more powerful or of a higher position in uh, life and society, more experienced, and she often is a supernatural creature, some kind of goddess, some kind of heroine, some kind of sorceress, and it all doesn't prevent her from being very often a damsel in distress. You would have a model uh, situation like that in Arthurian romance, where you'd have a knight, for example, in the uh, English version of uh, Le Belle Anconie, you'd have a knight uh, who meets a princess in the forest. She's a sorceress, and she's being attacked by an unwanted suitor. Uh, once he helps her, she gives him some magical help and some magical advice. So she performs uh, two, and in many versions, because in some versions he marries the Princess of Wales, in some he marries that woman. So in uh, some versions she's all three. A supernatural being, a damsel in distress, and a future wife. <coughs> Here you have. What, what really, um, what really uh, strikes a reader is the difference in position between this character. This is why she's treated often like a mother or goddess figure. Uh, and the hero, who usually is a, more than a little afraid of her and more than a little awed by her. <laughs> 